Majora's Mask. Just what is this mysterious entity's story? In my last Majora's Mask theory, we delved into the mask connections to the Happy Mask salesman, and the extent of Majora's relationship with the world of Termina. And while that's all fine and good, on closer inspection I've discovered there is still much more of this story to tell. The story of the true origins of Majora's Mask, and its hidden connection to the world of Hyrule that has been swept under the rug. Before we can look into Majora's history, however, first we must unravel another. There has long been a theory known as a the Tetraforce theory. It originates from the simple observation that on the Hylian shield design from Ocarina of Time, there used to be a golden triangle displayed at the bottom of the crest, a triangle that when applied to the Triforce on the upper half of the shield, makes a complete shape. This theory has been kicking around the Zelda community for quite some time now, and I have always personally found it quite interesting. While its origins of a fourth triangle at the bottom of a shield design might not be the most concrete of evidence, the shape of the Triforce alone raises this question of a potential fourth piece long before the shield even came into the picture. Why is there a hole in the middle of this sacred relic? It could be to balance out the flagship characteristics of the Triforce, or it could be to warn of the dangers that come from embracing any of these virtues too vehemently. The Tetraforce theory isn't nearly as popular nowadays as when it was first proposed. This is primarily due to the removal of the triangle at the bottom of the Hylian Shield crest and subsequent game releases, and some, as far as I can tell, false information spreading around about series creator Shigeru Miyamoto openly denying the existence of a fourth Triforce piece. In reality, I can't find any evidence of such claims from Miyamoto, but if you do know something more, please let me know in the comments. But for now, I think it's fair to say that the existence of a fourth Triforce piece to perfect this shape and turn it into a Tetraforce cannot be outright denied. And while you can look at its removal from future shield crests in almost all games following Ocarina of Time as a way of softly denying this theory, you could also see that as a simple design change. Because why would they continue to show and include a detail in later games when Ocarina of Time and its sequel have already told the whole story? This world was created by three goddesses during the time of chaos. Din, the goddess of power, created the land. Nehru, the goddess of wisdom, created order. Feror, the goddess of courage, created the diverse inhabitants. Upon leaving the world, the goddesses left behind the Triforce, three golden triangles. It is said that any wish the possessor of the Triforce desires will come true. A strong heart, innate ability, and a balance of the three virtues are required to be granted a wish. To have a Triforce piece, one needs a corresponding god and virtue. So. If a fourth Triforce piece really does exist, who is that god, and what is their virtue? Many have questioned if that fourth piece could belong to the goddess Hylia, and if her virtue could be time, an element that is a powerful reoccurring theme in the Zelda series. And while that is a decently sound conclusion, it's not mine. Hylia is a guardian of the Triforce, not one of its direct creators. The Triforce and the world of Hyrule were created by the original goddesses Din, Nehru, and Feror. In this sense, Hylia seems to be on a lower hierarchy of power than the three golden goddesses. But that leaves us with the question, who else could be this fourth god? Majora. Think about it. Who else in the Zelda series fits the description of a god besides Hylia and the three golden goddesses? Maybe Demise, but I feel like he falls more under the category of demon than god. Majora, on the other hand, as we discussed in the last theory, has many clues hinting at its origin as a powerful deity. So, we have our god, but what's their virtue? Well, isn't it obvious? Chaos. Look at Majora's behavior in the final boss fight. Sporadic, ever-changing, unpredictable. Look at what Majora did to the land of Termina, the unease and disarray it brought not only to the present day land, but also to the past kingdom of Akana. Look at Majora's motivations. It doesn't control the Skull Kid and attempt to bring down the moon on Termina to gain some power or dominion. It does so because it thinks it's fun. It thinks it's a game. This world was created by three goddesses during the time of chaos. Finally, these words from Hyrule Historia. Why is Majora not mentioned in the legend of Hyrule's creation? or among the ranks of the three golden goddesses? Maybe because it predates them. Maybe because they were created to stop it. Or maybe because this is a legend, and legends 
can be warped. The fourth Triforce virtue is chaos. For too much of any of the three, power, wisdom, or courage, can only lead one to madness. Now, let's look at how what we have devised fits into the bigger picture. According to the Happy Mask salesman, Majora's Mask was used by an ancient tribe in hexing rituals before its power became too great, and it destroyed them. He goes on to explain that the calamity brought by Majora's Mask was so great that our ancestors who feared this sealed it within the eternal darkness so that it would not be misused. Despite his explanation, he never details the exact origins of Majora's Mask, such as how it was made or how it came to possess such wicked power. My theory is that the mask itself was crafted by one of two parties, but that the spirit that now inhabits it is the goddess of chaos, Majora. The goddess's spirit was trapped inside the mask using the Song of Healing, its first ever use, which also explains how Majora and the mask salesman initially learned this melody. It's just a matter of who exactly was the one to seal this chaos goddess inside the iconic mask. First, the obvious answer, the ancient ones. This tribe could have used the mask in ancient rituals, but also have created it, and trapped the spirit of the goddess Majora inside it. In anger at being imprisoned in a mask, Majora would have lashed out against the tribe, slaughtering them in the process. That's one way to explain why Majora finds itself confined to a mask, but there is a second, and even more compelling possibility. What if Majora was sealed in this mask long before the Ancient Ones found it? Long before… anything really. What if Majora was sealed in this mask at the very beginning, the time of chaos referred to in Hyrule's creation story? The three golden goddesses emerged into this world to quell that chaos, and sealed the eldest goddess, Majora. Majora's spirit was confined to a mask, and greatly weakened. This mask would later be found by the Ancient Ones, who would become Majora's first victims in this new form. So, going off the assumption that the Ancient Ones existed sometime after Hylians re-inhabited the surface of Hyrule after Scoured Sword, Majora would take a long rest before it would next appear. This isn't anything new, as we discovered a similar long resting spell for the mask between the fall of Akana Kingdom and its re-emergence for the main events of Majora's Mask. The stories of Minish Cap and Four Swords would pass by before the time Majora returned to wreak havoc on the world, this time in the form of war. The Hyrulean Civil War is one of the many off-screen conflicts of the Zelda series that plays a major role in establishing the setting of the game that follows it, in this case, Ocarina of Time. Not many details have been revealed about this war, such as how it started, how long it lasted, and how it ended. The little information we do learn about this war between the inhabitants of Hyrule comes from the text detailing Link's backstory in Ocarina of Time. Some time ago, before the King of Hyrule unified this country, there was a fierce war in our world. One day to escape the fires of war, a Hylian mother and her baby boy entered this forbidden forest. The mother was gravely injured. Her only choice was to entrust the child to the Deku Tree. An ununified kingdom fighting amongst themselves leading to their downfall. Now where have I heard that before? The Kingdom of Akana, a parallel world's version of the Kingdom of Hyrule, a kingdom that was toppled by its own squabbles over power. And just as is implied in the Hyrulean Civil War and the Shadow Temple, fought against deadly shadow folk spying on the kingdom from within. The parallels between the two are too strong to deny. And just as I explained why Majora is likely behind the fall of Akana, so too do I think the Hyrulean Civil War might just be the first instance of this same chaotic influence. After a long rest, the Goddess of Chaos finally reappeared, and decided it was about time to have some fun. Majora expanded its influence over every citizen in Hyrule. People across the land began to become restless and uneasy. The royal family sought more power through border expansion. The Sheikah tribe sought more recognition and to be seen as more than shadow assassins. The Gerudo found themselves longing for a non-desolate home, like the green fields of Hyrule. The list goes on and on. Everyone began to seek something they didn't have, but their neighbors did. This is the true origin of the Hyrulean Civil War, a mere image of what Majora would later do again in its own parallel world. Majora is the fourth golden goddess of Hyrule. The bearer of the lost piece of the Triforce, disgraced and trapped in a mask, it would return from a long slumber aeons later to do what it does best, plunge the world into chaos. 
That leads us to the final piece of the story. How Majora was sealed away in the eternal darkness. It is implied in the backstory of Ocarina of Time and the non-canon Zelda manga for the game that Link's father was a soldier who fought in the Hyrulean Civil War. Now, it's been debated if the title The Hero of Hyrule and their connection to the Triforce of Courage is something that's passed down by blood or by spirit. But considering the Ocarina of Time Link reappears in Twilight Princess as the Hero of Shade, an ancestor of that Link, I don't think it's that much of a stretch to assume that the title and connection are inherited by Bloodline, at least at this point in the timeline. So you can probably see where I'm going with this, but yes, I think that Link's father also served as a hero that saved Hyrule from total chaos. However, he was unique from both his predecessors and successors. He was the only one that was ever able to tap into the Triforce's full power. Let me remind you that Majora's Mask plays a fair game. In Termina, it doesn't allow Link a fight without first offering him a chance to even the playing field. And it did the exact same here. Link's father, the hero of the Civil War, challenged Majora with a balance of power, wisdom, and courage. But Majora, knowing its own power, and wanting a fair and glorious battle, offered Link's father the missing piece. The Triforce of Chaos. In doing so, Majora created an unstoppable warrior. The Fierce Deity. What followed was a gruesome battle, showing the incredible strength Majora had granted this hero, essentially turning him into a demigod. But for all the power this Triforce piece granted, in turn, it consumed in madness. An inability to control oneself. Its corruption of the three balanced virtues leads the bearer into an uncontrollable state. The deity decimated Majora in their final battle, but holding on to the sliver of humanity left in him after being consumed by this power couldn't destroy the mask. He, the Hylian hero, the fierce deity, sealed Majora away in a realm known as the Eternal Darkness, but in doing so, also had to seal himself away. Thus, the world lost a god, a Triforce piece, and a hero. But from here, the story does go on, just not in Hyrule. The Eternal Darkness is a term used in the original Japanese translation explaining where Majora was sealed in its origin story. In the last theory, I speculated that Hyrule's sages might have carried out this seal. But when factoring in the Fierce Deity and the question as to why Majora would carry this mask during the events of its game, I believe this outcome makes more sense. Also, notice the fact that the Eternal Darkness has never been mentioned as a plane of existence outside of this antidote in Majora's Mask. Maybe because its existence is unbeknownst to anyone outside of Majora and the Fierce Deity. What follows after Majora and the Deity are sealed away in this mysterious realm is as we explored in the truth behind the Happy Mask Salesman. The birth of a new world out of darkness. A cycle of events all too familiar. And finally, a hero challenging this broken god of chaos one last time. Link assumes the form of the Fierce Deity through a mask, unlike his father, who absorbed Majora's Triforce piece and became it. Link was able to destroy the spirit of Majora once and for all because of his father's sacrifice. Giving his own life and holding on to his humanity allowed Link to overcome the madness of the Fierce Deity by not becoming it, but by channeling its power through a mask. Link saved Termina with his father's spirit right by his side. That's my theory on the surprisingly deep origins behind Majora's Mask and the Fierce Deity. But one more thing I wanted to share was a story that could be interpreted as inspiration behind this tale, if it turns out to be true. Shinto is a religion practiced throughout most of Japan, and has taken direct influence on many different types of Japanese media. When writing this video, I became curious if there might be any parallels between the story I'd uncovered here and the mythology of Shinto, and what I discovered was quite shocking. Amatsu Mikaboshi is often described as the Japanese god of evil. Amatsu Mikaboshi is neither god nor evil. Instead, he is a primordial force that existed before this world was formed. Amatsu Mikaboshi is a nebulous presence, and attempts to explain who or what he is are no less nebulous. At some point, he may have been the only force in this world. Amatsu Mikaboshi may be the primordial great void. He ruled the universe, if only because nothing else existed. Somehow, during the creation of the modern universe, his power was broken, but never completely disappeared. Instead, his aura or residue remains. An alternative myth suggests that Amatsu Mikaboshi was one of the imperfect children discarded by Izanami and Izanagi. Either way, Amatsu Mikaboshi is in the world, 
but not of the world. He has no clear official part or function to play. He doesn't even have a corporal form in which to manifest. He is a bitter, coldly angry, disenfranchised presence. He has no shrines and is not of much relevance to the average person. Shinto is a spiritual system that values harmony. Amatsu Mikaboshi is associated with lingering energies and emotions, especially excessive ones that destroy harmony or create imbalance in the world. He doesn't necessarily share or incite these emotions. Instead, intense, uncontrolled emotions are perceived as sharing his essence. They are magnetically attracted to Amatsu Mikaboshi, as he is to them, because they are made of the same stuff and potentially have the same effect, destructive disharmony. Thus, excessive anger, envy, even love, which potentially leads to unhealthy obsessions, is perceived as belonging to Amatsu Mikaboshi and expressing his essence. Shocking, isn't it? Just how similar some of the portions of this myth about Amatsu Mikaboshi are to the theory about Majora's Mask I explained to you here today. Of course, not everything matches up, but what did just surprised me so much. Anyway, that's the theory, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you have not already. It really helps me out in continuing to grow and continuing to make videos like this one right here. So if you enjoyed it and you haven't yet, make sure you hit the little red button below this video. You're just doing a huge solid for me. And uh, I very much appreciate the support, guys. Thank you. Beyond that, as always, I want to hear what you guys thought in the comments down below. Did you like some parts of the theory? Did you not like other parts of the theory? Did you love the whole thing? Did you hate all of it? Um, if you did, I'm sorry. And uh, my bad. Again, if you like the video, make sure you hit the like button too, because YouTube likes it when you do that and shares the video around more. And that means more people get to see the theory. And that's a big thumbs up for me. Uh, also, Throughout this theory, I referred back to another one I did a few weeks ago at some points, and if you haven't seen that one, that'll be linked at the end card for this video, and I'm sure it's already been linked in like the cards for the video too, and you can just go find it on the channel too if you want. It's the truth behind the Happy Mask Salesman. Really fun video as well, so uh, if you like this one, you haven't seen that one yet, perfect place to go next. If you think I'm a pretty interesting person for some reason from just listening to me talk about this Zelda theory, you can find me on Twitter at XenogamerYT, join the Discord server with a link in the description below, and follow me on Twitch for streams every Friday uh, to just learn more about me, I guess, and just uh, hang out some more and uh, have some fun, you know? It's a fun community. Join us. And that's about all I have here to say today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. I know it's a bit of a longer one. Uh, also, let me know in the comments, do you enjoy, like, longer theories or, like, shorter ones? Because uh, it's always good to, like, know, I guess. So just uh, let me know again. Let me know, you know. And again, thank you for watching the video. I probably said that a bunch at this point. But thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a great day. Thanks for stopping by, guys. And I will see you later. Bye-bye.